Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Indizor Education. Um, we continue talking about Maxwell's equations for the electromagnetic field. This is the third lecture about the third equation. Now, um, this one is about um, putting into differential form the Faraday's law of um, electromagnetic induction. So whenever you have a changing magnetic field, it generates um, electric field. Now, first of all, I would like you to, I would like you to strongly suggest um, to review material uh, from the electromagnetism part of this course related to the law of induction. So there is a topic, there are a few lectures there, familiarize it, because I will definitely use these results um, without going into many details. Uh, the only thing which I will do, just to remind you, uh, I, I will just remind you one particular experiment. Um, experiment is very, very simple. You have a wire loop and you have, a, let's say, a permanent magnet, which you are moving, let's say, down in this particular case. Now, as soon as you move down inside the ring, um, the electric current will be generated. So that's basically the beginning of um, this concept of um, the concept of induction. Whenever the changing magnetic field induces the electric current in the wire. So that's basically what we will be talking about today, um, putting this into quantitative uh, format. Um, after James uh, Maxwell's uh, third equation. Now, this lecture is part of the course called uh, Physics for Teens, presented on unisor.com. Every lecture on that side has textual explanation. In this particular case, textual explanation is um, very detailed, and during the lecture, I might actually uh, just skip a couple of things, basically referring you to the text when it's kind of tedious, long, and uh, obvious. Um, now, the site is completely free. There are no advertisements. You don't even have to sign in if you don't want to. Um, the site has um, uh, exams for many topics, not all of them, but for many topics. You can take them, again, free any number, uh, any number of times you want. So I do suggest you to use the website rather than, um, for instance, you might find it on YouTube or somewhere else, this particular lecture, where it will be just the lecture without textual explanation, without previous lecture, which you know have to you know, find or something like this. From the website, there is a menu, so everything will be kind of obvious. You go sequentially lecture after lecture. Okay, so I have reminded you about this thing. And now let me go into a little bit more specific things. First of all, um, why electric current circulates in this particular wire loop? Well, because there is some kind of um, electric field. It's the field which pushes electrons around in this particular case. Now, what if there is no wire loop at all? Will the electric field be there? Of course it will. I mean, wire loop is just a, a device which helps us to see what's going on. But basically what's going on is going on regardless of whether wire loop is there or not. Same thing with this particular permanent magnet. What if I'll just say, okay, there is a magnetic field which is changing in time. Is it sufficient? Yes, it is sufficient. So basically the point is, if there is a changing magnetic field somewhere, somehow, it generates the electric field as well. <coughs> now, we have agreed before that magnetic field and the electric field have something which we call uh, the field intensity. So there is a magnetic field intensity and there is an electric field intensity. Now, what is intensity? Basically, it's the force which acts on some kind of a unit of uh, 
whatever the unit is. If it's electric field, there is something which we call a charge, so a unit of charge, and the force which actually acts in that particular time and space location onto the unit charge would be exactly the electric field intensity. In case of magnetic um, field, we also measure magnetic field intensity and there is also a unit of um, magnetic field uh, well amount if you wish if you wish not magnetic field amount a amount of magnetism it might be something like uh, artificially created uh, magnet let's say a wire with one particular uh, one ampere uh, going through one um, meter of length of the wire or something like this so whatever we have assigned as a unit of magnetism um, and the force which is acting on that particular unit of magnetism would be a magnetic field intensity. So, let's talk about magnetic field intensity first. Since it's a force, it's a vector. So, B is a vector. Now, in three-dimensional world, any vector can be represented as three components. projections of this vector to uh, three axes. Now at the same time, now these are vectors. At the same time I can write it differently. If i, j and k are unit vectors along the three axis x, y, and z. Now, b, x, b, y, and b, z are magnitudes of this vector. So, I basically divided vector into magnitude and direction. And I can do that because I know the direction of this vector. We agree that this is the uh, projection on the x-axis, so uh, it goes along the same as uh, vector i, which is a unit vector along the x-axis. Same thing with y and z. So, we assume that there is such a vector. Now, it's kind of difficult to um, basically come up with some quantitative evaluation of all of these together in one shot. So, what I will do, I will just choose one particular axis and I will consider only vector Bz, which is Bz times k if you wish, and I will find out what's the electric effect of this particular vector, magnetic uh, vector, um, what kind of electric field it creates. Now, then I will do exactly the same with this one and this one. And now I will use the principle of superposition. If they're together, well, the total uh, effect should be a sum of effect of each one of these. Right? So, Right now, we are considering the vector field B, which is only directed along the z-axis, okay? So, right now, its entire magnetic field is directed along the z-axis only. So, by and bz are equal to zero. We are considering only these type types of magnetic field. Now, obviously, bz is a function of time and location. Now, we do know the direction of this vector. I can put the vector as well. We know the direction of this vector is along the z-axis. That's all we are kind of assuming right now. Okay. <coughs> now, we know that from the electromagnetism part of this course that if there is a change in magnetic field it generates electric field and if the change of magnetic field is always within the z-axis then, then the electric field intensity would be perpendicular to it. So, 
let's do the same experiment as, the, as we did before. Instead of permanent magnet, I'm just assuming that there is some kind of a vector vertically directed. These are my three axes, okay? And um, I will put my wire, well, in this case it would be not wire loop, it will be wire rectangle. Uh, perpendicularly to this guy, perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field intensity. Now, if this is changing with time, still uh, within the z-axis, but it can change in magnitude. So whenever it's changing in magnitude, it's the same thing as permanent magnet I'm moving f uh, back and forth vertically. So there will be um, uh, electric current generated in this particular um, wire rectangle. Now, what I will do is I will consider this wire rectangle to be very, very small. So, its dimensions would be delta x by delta y, and I assume that they're, they're small enough. Now, why um, I, I would like to do that well, because I don't want to be dependent on entire set of different values. I would like to be dependent only on the value of this vector bz at particular point x, y, and z. So I choose any particular point x, y, and z. And I will center this particular rectangle in such a way that its middle, this middle of this, would be uh, would have a coordinates um, x, y, and z. So that will be this is, let's say, x, this is y, and this is z. So this will be x, y, and this would be z somewhere. Okay? So this is the point x, y, and z. And I have a plane parallel to x, y, and in that plane I will put my wire rectangle. Now, from the view from the top would be like this. I will have x, y, and I will have this. Center would be x and y, and since the whole length is a, b, c, d, I don't need this anymore. So what's the coordinates of the points A, B, and C, and D? So A will have coordinates um, x minus delta x divided by 2, right? Uh, y minus delta y divided by 2, and z. B would be at coordinates x plus delta x of our arm. Uh, y will be still minus delta 2 z. C would be at x plus delta x papala. Y would be plus delta y half z. D is x minus delta x over 2. Y would be plus delta y over 2 and z. So this is my rectangle. Now, <coughs> again, why do I um, need such a small rectangle? Because I would like to know the flux which goes through this particular um, wire loop, wire rectangle, and relate it to electromotive force according to the Faraday's law. Now, Faraday's law is very simple. And again, if you don't remember it, I refer you to electromagnetism part of this course. This is a flux which goes through this wire rectangle. Now we are taking the first derivative by time, and this is electromotive force which is generated in the wire. Okay, now, again, let me remind you what the flux is. Well, if you have a vector B, 
and this is this rectangular wire loop. Now, if B is constant, everywhere exactly the same, then the flux is actually the B times uh, area of the loop, or, or a rectangle, whatever the, wire, whatever the area is. Now, in this case, we have a very small rectangle, so its area is this. Now, B, well, B in theory is different. Uh, we all, all we know is it's vertically directed along the z-axis, but it changes with time. Uh, however, we are getting this um, rectangle very, very small. So, approximately, in our case, we can have that this is phi approximately equal to b uh, of, well, it's bz actually, because we're only talking about um, uh, uh, vectors directed along the z-axis from x, y, and z times dx times dy. So I took the value in the middle, x, y, well, and z, obviously. We uh, uh, took the value of the magnetic uh, field intensity in the middle and multiply by area, assuming that this particular um, wire rectangle is small enough so the value of the vector um, b is not really changing much and obviously eventually we will just say okay we consider this infinitesimally small um, uh, wire rectangle which basically makes this thing in in the limit case absolute true okay fine so here is the connection this is something which depends on the magnetic field. This is something which is electric field characterization. So this basically is the beginning of the future Maxwell's equations which connect together basically two intensities. B, intensity of the magnetic field, and E, intensity of the electric field. But that's the beginning. So we have to come up with this, basically, in terms of whatever we have, basically, in this particular case. All right. So we know all this. And now let me just go back to this picture. If I have um, an electric field and I have two points, and let's say electric field is constant. And let's say it's directed from one point to another point. Now, electromotive force, basically, it's basically a, a, a voltage between these two points, right? And um, the voltage is amount of work to move one unit of uh, electricity from one point to another. Either the field does it or we do it against the field. But anyway, that's the uh, amount of work. So U is work. Now, if it's a field which is uniform, which means E, intensity of the field is exactly uh, the same, and we are assuming it's from P to Q, then this is equal to E times L where L is the length of this particular segment from P to Q. That's the simplest case, right? It's like you're saying the work is equal to force times distance, right? This is the force, this is the distance. Force basically on the unit charge, and this is also per unit charge. So force times distance. Now, if situation is more complex, let's say the force is at the angle, then what we do? Well, we do projection of this force on this direction. Well, it's actually in vector form, it's a scalar product, right? Um, so you have a projection. And uh, if the um, value of the intensity is changing, then basically we have to really divide it into small pieces 
and say that du, which is differential of incremental, infinitesimal incremental of the electromotive force, is equal to E at that particular point, uh, let's say, I don't know, coordinate, some kind of coordinate, times dx, if x is, if this is x axis. Now, and then we should really integrate the whole thing from P to Q to find out entire electromotive force. That's if E is changing. Okay, in our case, E is changing, but not too much. I mean, obviously, now if, for instance, our current is directed like uh, counterclockwise, so I will put these little arrows here. So the magnet, uh, magnetic field is directed perpendicular to the whiteboard and it's changing, this is the z-axis, so it's changing uh, along the z-axis and it causes the electric current. Now, how to find the entire electromotive force? Well, again, considering it's a very small rectangle, I will assume that during this from A to B there is no change in, electro, uh, in electric field and I can just take it in the middle here. Same thing from B to C, I can take in the middle, from C to D and from D to A. So I'll take these middle points as the electric uh, field intensity. And again, in the limit case, it's absolutely legitimate thing, because whenever I will do it infinitesimally small, there is basically no difference between electric field at point A and, and, and B. Now, entire electromotive, uh, uh, entire intensity of electric field here is basically, well, first of all, again, it's function of um, actually time as well. All right, it's function of time and coordinates. In general, if there is this field somewhere, right? Now, I can always represent it as three components, Ex of T, X, Y, Z plus Ey of the same plus Ez of the same. Okay? Why? Well, it's actually very important. If I'm moving from A to B, I actually can take into consideration only EX component because EY is perpendicular. You remember the work is equal to projection of the force on the uh, direction of the movement, right? So projection of vector EY on, uh, if the movement is from A to B is zero. They're perpendicular to each other. So I can always take a, a, a EX. Now EZ which is the component, is always zero because all these movements are always in the plane which is perpendicular to the z-axis. So um, when I'm talking about from A to B, I will take only the E-X component. From B to C, I will take only Y component. Then from C to D also X and from D to A also X. So let's just do it and I will go in, in, in this cycle and I'll find out how much work I need to move from A to B and then from B to C, etc. And that would be my total um, electromotive force, which on the other hand can be expressed in terms of magnetic field. And that would be my equation. Okay? So, forget about this. We know this. And let's think about this. Okay, from A to B, I have to take basically um, the middle point of, electro, uh, of electric field intensity, which is Ex, and I will use uh, now T and Z, time and Z will always be the same, so I will just skip them. 
but for x it would be um, uh, what's the coordinate of this x and y coordinate would be y minus delta y over 2 right and t and z I will just skip so this would be intensity of electric field at middle point between A and B. Its x coordinate is x because this point is x and y coordinate would be y minus delta y over 2. And I assume this will be a constant um, electric field intensity along the way from A to B and I will have to multiply it by the length. Length is delta x. Okay. Now let's go from B to C. From B to C, middle point is this one, and I will use, instead of EX, the horizontal component, I will use EY. And so it will be EY, what's the coordinates of this point? By X it would be X plus delta X over 2, and by Y it will be Y, and I will multiply it by the length of this BC segment plus let's move from C to D again I'll take the midpoint which has coordinate X and Y plus delta so it's again EX with coordinates X and in this case Y plus delta Y over 2 now my length is delta X but now I'm moving to the negative direction so I have to put minus delta x. Now from D to A, again I will use EY along this y direction. Now coordinates of this point would be x minus delta x over 2 and on y it would be y and minus delta y because I'm moving against direction of the y-axis. Now, and this is my u. Okay? That's the total work which is needed to move once along this cycle. Now, I don't need this anymore. And I will use just this. And what it's equal to? Let's collect delta x. Delta x would be ex of x y minus delta y over 2 times delta x minus ex x plus delta y over 2. I don't need this anymore. And this would be my delta x plus. How about delta y? I will have delta y of x plus delta x over 2 comma y minus um, EY of X minus delta X over 2Y delta Y okay another trick um, another trick related to uh, calculus if you have a function and you have a difference between these two okay remember this formula <coughs> from calculus if you have a function from A to B then the difference between these two between between this and this, let's say, this is middle point in, in, in theory, right? Now, um, 
what this uh, theorem is saying that there is some kind of a um, midpoint C, not necessarily exactly in between, it all depends on the function, but there is a fu point C and this is the um, derivative so it would be by mi b minus um, uh, a times derivative which is tangent of this angle so basically the difference would be this piece it's a very known theorem in, in calculus which I'm going to use and again if you um, don't remember you can always go back to unisor.com mass 14's course go to calculus it's presented there now from this actually if you remember we built the x plus delta x x that would be approximation x times delta x that's basically how derivative is defined we take incremental in, in infinitesimal incremental of x and b uh, have the difference between these guys and define the tangent as this that's the definition of um, derivative so I'm using this basically right so this and this um, I think I uh, I did something wrong here I missed something so um, that would be hmm, I forgot okay plus it should be y plus uh, x comma y plus delta y okay right I think that's how it's supposed to be yeah so here is what we have here <coughs> first of all we are dealing with function of two arguments but in this particular case I have only one argument changing from one position to another position so basically this is left end y minus delta y over 2 and this is the right end so again using my f of b minus f of a approximately equals to f of let's say a or b or c doesn't matter times b minus a so in this case x is fixed y is Mm, y minus delta would be this and y plus would be would be this all right so this difference is e x of x some middle point and we will have by by y so we will have um, a derivative I'm, I'm using the partial derivative because only y is changing, x is not changing. So it's a uh, derivative in, in some midpoint, basically midpoint is y. Whenever I'm getting smaller and smaller, the midpoint and both ends are actually going into one point, so it's quite legitimate. And I have to multiply it by the difference between b and uh, and, and A, right? B is this, A is this, so the difference would be minus delta Y, correct? Minus delta Y uh, by half and minus delta Y by, by half would be minus, minus delta Y. Here, plus. Same thing, it's X which is changing. So I will use partial derivative of XY at point x by dx and difference between b and a would be delta x uh, delta I, I, y this is e y 
That's it. We have finished. So this is the fourth one, which we are looking for. So it's D, uh, yes, D Y of X Y by D X. times dx times well I just wiped it out but there is a multiplier delta y so it's a delta y and I will use in one particular expression here and d uh, e x of x y by dy times dx times dy so the first difference between EX and EX I replaced with um, derivative times dy and there was a delta x multiplier already that's why I have dx and dy um, and then this one would be exactly uh, analogous because this is um, derivative by, by dx then I had to multiply it by dx, and then there was a there was a multiplier dy, the delta y. So that's why this would be my final formula. And this is e. This is this is my u. Which is um the total work which is needed, etc. Now, let's go here. What is F? In our case, I can say that F is, is a function of, um, well, obviously, in the middle point. Now, this vector is always perpendicular to my wire loop. That's why I can use just straight um, multiplication by the area right area doesn't depend on time so if I want derivative I have to have derivative of this right so and this is also what minus u right minus is equal to look at these two things they're very close to each other. So what follows from it? That this part is equal to this part, well, with a minus sign. So we have d e y by d x. Now, now let me just put all the uh, all the argument, not only x and y, minus d e x of t x y z by d y is equal to minus uh, z b of t x y z with d t. I'm using partial derivative here obviously because it's function of many arguments. I should really put another d here. Okay, this is a very important equation because this is basically almost everything I wanted to do. All I have to do right now is expand it to other dimensions to x, y, and z and I'll be done. So, this is all about vector called bz that's what i should really put here bz so if my vector b of uh, of magnetic field intensity is only along the z axis and equal to bz then this is true great for instance my b is only within y direction so instead of this formula, which is directed along the z-axis, 
I should really direct it along the y-axis. Well, let me just write it down, basically replacing um, what I will replace and how very easily. Z would be to y, y to x, and x to z. I'll just turn the whole thing. Cyclical substitution. So exactly the same formula. So it would be d e instead of y x of all these three parameters divided, I mean, uh, partial by x goes to z um, minus d e x is z for d x equals minus d b y in this case for d t. Now I don't put all this t x y z because it's always the same. So that's my um, analogous equation but in case my magnetic field intensity is along the um, y axis. And now let's call uh, what if it's along the x-axis? So I will have z would be going to x, um, y goes to uh, z, and uh, x goes to y, if I'm not mistaken, right? <coughs> z to x, okay, it's like x, y, and z. So z to x, x to y, and y to z. Right, that's correct. Okay. So from here we will have y to z, so it's g e z by d y, right, minus d e y by d z equals minus d b uh, x by d t. Okay, here are my three equations, absolutely analogous. This one is the result of, this is electric uh, field intensity based on vector uh, of magnetic intensity uh, stretched along the z-axis. This is my electric field intensity uh, as b stretched only <coughs> in the y direction. And this is only if my magnetic field intensity is along the x direction. Now, what if it's a combination like this? Well, I'll just add them up together, basically, and that's it. So I will multiply this by my vector. I will multiply this by g vector. So it would be times i here, times g here, and here times k times k. And if I add them up together, <coughs> on the right side I will have basically the um, combination of derivative by x direction, derivative by b direction, derivative by c direction, which is a vector uh, which can be Uh, which can be expressed as this. What is the derivative of the vector? Well, it's a vector which is sum of derivative of each component. Y, J and K are not dependent on time, so derivative of the entire thing is derivative of this, and I would be a multiplier derivative of by, j would be multiplier as a vector, and derivative of bz. So exactly like we have here. That's on the right side. 
with a minus sign. Okay, what will be on the left side? On the left side it would be this times i plus this times j plus this times k. One square brackets, another and the third one. That would be on the, on the left side. Looks like a very large formula, right? And now, as the final accord of this particular lecture, uh, I uh, will do a little trick. Now, you know about the symbol nabla. Symbol nabla. It's a kind of a, a pseudo vector. We used it when we were considering um, the first and the second Maxwell's formula. Now, <coughs> in the first and second, we were using scalar uh, dot product of this and electric field intensity. In this case, I will use a vector product. Now, what is this, basically? Again, using, it, it's, again, it's not a real vector. It's a triplet of um, operators of differentiation. But if I'm using a formal substitution, that's a combination of three vectors. Again, vectors in quotes, right? i, j, and k. I just divided one vector into three components. If I will multiply this vector by vector e, which is ex times i plus ey j plus ez k, multiply vector by vector as a vector product, <laughs> the funny thing is you will get exactly the left part of this equation. Um, now, if you don't believe me now, you can go to a textual part of this lecture where I basically very, very tediously multiply this by this, which means like three of these, three of those, so it's nine different, uh, 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 different uh, terms here, and then I have to basically multiply i by i, which is zero, vector product of vector by itself is zero, i by j, i by j, vector product is actually k. Um, so if you are familiar with vector product, I mean, if, again, if you don't, go to mass routines where it's all explained. So, and that's some kind of a, a trick which brings you to a very nice formula. So instead of all this, Instead of all this, you will have just this formula, but this would be expressed as nabla vector product with E equals minus dB by dt. And this is the third equation of Maxwell. Now, um, I'm not pretending I did everything 100% rigorously. There were some shortcuts, etc. But anyway, I just wanted you to feel basically this formula where it comes from. And the very last trick from here to here, I, I just suggest you to read the text of this lecture. Go to unisor.com. Um, it's a part called waves, field waves, topic called field waves. And that's where the equations number three is. So it's all explained there, but it's again, it's a long and tedious multiplication of this by this, and you will get exactly this. Well, some smart people actually came up with this idea, and uh, well, that's what it is. So you've got this thing, and I, again, I suggest you to read the text, complete text for this lecture. It will basically um, put some more emphasis wherever it's necessary. Other than that, thank you very much and good luck.